Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Dyer from Lawrence Technological University in Michigan. Welcome, Coach. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, you know, it's, again, one of those schools I, I've got to look up, see where it is, and it turns out it's about 10 miles from where my wife grew up, and so I've been in that neighborhood many times but have not been on campus, so I might have to have to do that if I visit up at Christmas time and and see what you guys are all about. But um, your your NAIA um, a lot there's a really tough conference there in Michigan uh, on the NAIA yes. side of things. Yeah, very tough conference. We got some great schools in our conference: Indiana Tech, uh, Qantas, UNOH, Madonna, um, Cena Heights, and more. Uh, it's really, as I like to say, the whack is whack. <laughs> you never know who can be, who's going to show up. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, uh, Cornerstone was playing UNOH. Cornerstone had no goalkeeper, so they put their six in goal. And they got their first ever win over UNOH. So anything is possible. Yep, that's why that's why we play the game, right? So, uh, yeah. I mean, with, with all that, competitiveness in the conference i mean i'm guessing you guys are probably competing on the recruiting trail as well um what what do you typically see as your timeline in terms of when your recruiting class is is kind of shored up and then and then like right now you know it's aug end of august are you are you looking at, are you still looking at 25s? Are you st starting to talk 26s? Like kind of what, what does your overall timeline look like? Yeah. So right now we're currently um, looking at 2025 and we're starting to look in 2026. We're getting some emails from 2027. Um, for us, we have two teams. We have first team and reserve team, like most NAI programs, D3 and some D2s. So right now we have 61 total players. Um, I'm graduating 11, so I'm really only looking to bring in five to six players for the 2025 class. I want to bring it back down just a little bit to make it more manageable and uh, provide everyone the, the best experience that we can. Um, a 2026, you know, it's, it's for us, it's pretty much year to year. We'll look ahead and start to get, see what's attractive, what's not. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just focused right now on next fall. Okay. Well, it, in that focus, you know, there's obviously a lot of good soccer up in the, in yeah. the Michigan, Detroit, Grand Rapids, all over yeah. where, but where are you focused? Cause I noticed there is a lot of international flavor on your roster as well. So, so where do you like to go? How do you do your recruiting? Uh, we do have that international flavor. I mean, the top teams in the NAIA are predominantly 100% international. Like, for example, if you take a look at UNOH, uh, I don't think they have one American on their roster, maybe on their reserve team. Um, but I like that mixture, that melting pot. Um, for us, we concentrate. We do look at MLS snacks, and there's some great – programs up here, Michigan Wolves, Michigan Jags, um, Midwest United, Vardar. Uh, we look at NAL, and then we look at National League, E64. You know, it's an alphabet soup out there. So we do get all around ECNL, ECNL Regional League. We go out of the state a lot uh, to look at Florida, uh down south, Virginia, Kentucky. So we've kind of branched out. The one area we haven't been most successful is obviously the east side. Um, there's great soccer in that New York, Connecticut area that we'd like to get into. But for now, it's a more of a mixture of international and then we'll go American. Like, I'll be honest with you, right now with, with us only looking at five to six players, I have this top kid that played the ECNL last year and he made the jump to MLS next for his last year. So he's going to be one that's looking obviously D1 and I'm not the prettiest girl at the dance, but I'm going to make an offer and I'm going to try to get him here. That's us. 
Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, do you guys um, do your own ID camps or work ID camps? Is that a part of your recruiting process at all? Yeah, so we do, um, we host a couple of camps, um, mostly through CSCC, you know, the college combine coaches clinic. Um, I've paired up with a couple of local uh, conference schools to do a combined camp and we'll move it around like this past year it was at Concordia, but unfortunately they're closing down next year. Um, so next year I'll probably be myself, Dearborn, Siena Heights. We'll get together. We do like a winter camp uh, because a lot of kids don't go down to Florida uh, for the tournament. So we'll have something up here and then we'll do one or two in the spring and one in the summer. Okay. So what we like to do, I mean, me is, um, I like to share the wealth. I mean, we're all competing against these big D1, D2 camps. So we're trying to navigate that and see how we can play it in our favor. Okay. Well, whether it's at a camp or an event or even through international video, I'm, I'm guessing you're not uh, taking a lot of European trips on to, yeah. to go recruiting. Um what is it that, that you're looking for in a player, both on the field and off the field? Uh, pretty much, I tell these kids, um, I want you to excite me, kind of like my wife did when I first started dating her. You know, um, I want to see you chase after a loose ball. I want to see you do all the little things. If you can capture my attention that first five minutes, I'm going to stay and I'm going to finish the game, watch and see how you handle yourself on and off. Off the field, um, obviously, we are a tech school. Uh, so engineering, architecture, business, uh, arts and sciences. And we just said I did health sciences. So we're kind of limited major-wise. So I have to look at that roster real quick and circle the engineers, circle those looking at computer science and some of the other new majors that we might have and focus a little bit on those kids. Cause that's my bread and butter. Um, other than that, I mean, it's really like, like you're dating, you know, honestly, let's be, you know, I'm going to reach out to you. You're going to come back. We're going to do a Google meet zoom meeting, get to know each other, talk to each other, answer some questions and see if we can make it work. That's it. Yeah, it's a it, it's a fun dance, that's for sure. Um, well, it is. It, and I'm not holding you to to hard numbers here, but uh, but just to give an idea of of what it, it would cost to attend oh. your school, yep. what what is the you know I what kind of academic yeah. money is available, what kind of athletic money is available, what, what's what's a typical player coming in looking at when they come to Lawrence Tech? So for us, I always start with the high price. I always estimate for players 16 credit hours, living on campus, room and board. So if I do all that, if I was recruiting you, for example, we'd start at that high price, 56. Then I show you how we can make it affordable, less credit hours, maybe take classes at some local community colleges that transfer in, uh, club chess. I'm big on that with my international players. So the way we do scholarships are pretty simple. So we have academic and we have athletic and they go together like peanut butter and jelly. Now academic is based on three things and I have no control over the academic. So your high school GPA, the types of classes you have taken or taking currently, AP honor classes in a 500 word essay. We no longer require the ACT or the SAT. You're starting to see a lot of colleges get away from that. Um, but if you've taken it, send it in, that may help get you more academic. So I would say for a top American player, uh, they're looking at anywhere between, and this is the athletic and, ath athletic and academic combined, uh, 20 to 32. All right, so a good chunk, probably about a third, maybe two thirds. International players we know don't qualify for FAFSA. 
So I have to hire, offer them a little bit higher. Uh, so my international players, uh, there's three tiers, the zero to 12 grand. I'll never get those kids. I would love to, but I'll never get them. The 12 to 18 grand, I might get one or two, 18 grand or more for them. So that's us. And it also comes down to what we need, like for 2025, I need a left back, I need six, I need nine, and a goalkeeper. So I'm focusing on those areas. I love American players, don't get me wrong. Um, they're great, and they adapt very well to the game. Um, the international players, it's up here. You know, they're very smart, tactical, tactical. Um, it's not just pass and kick the ball down and try to shove it down the other, the other team's throat. Uh, but that's, in a nutshell, us. So we do offer a very good athletic and academic, um, and we can make it a, a very attractive offer and a chance to play right away. No, that's awesome. Well, and let's talk a little bit more ab about the school. Uh, you're in the unique position as someone who pretty much founded the program. So I think you've got a pretty good uh, insight here. So what is it about the school that, that you love that, that made you want to do this, that keeps you here? What would be some things we don't know even by going through the website? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the family environment is just, I'll give you a story. I'm hearing impaired and COVID hit. Everybody was wearing masks and it was a nightmare. And I had three players that I recruited, two from Spain, one from Poland. And they came over and they graduated. We had a great four years with them. Um, and they wanted to give back to the program. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, 100 bucks, 50 bucks, all right, I'll take it. You know what I mean? And they said, no, coach, you changed our lives. You made an impact on our lives. We want to buy new kits for the team. Yeah. So I was blown away. And that's what keeps me coming back day in and day out is that impact I have on them and the impact that they have on me. Southfield, Michigan, we're, yeah, Detroit hustles hard. We're in a unique area. Like you said, we're 20, 25 minutes north of downtown Detroit. We have... University of Detroit Mercy to the south of us are about 15 minutes away. Oakland University, D1, about a half hour away. Michigan State, about an hour and a half. Um, and the University of Michigan. So we're in a great location. So it's not like you're stuck on campus. You can get out. Our players go downtown Detroit. They look across the river. Holy cow, it's Canada. You know, they're like, wow, we don't get that back home. Um and then they can go to other Division One. We've got some great schools, uh, D2, D3, NAIA, and junior college in the area. It's always something to do. So Southfield, like like uh, I may have mentioned to you earlier, we're pretty much in the center of it all. Like Michigan's shaped like the back of your hand. Here's Detroit. Here's Canada. We're right here. Everything's nearby. Yeah, it's uh, as someone who spent a lot of time there. It, it is a it is a cool yeah. place for sure. So, um, well, let's let's talk a little bit more about being in the season. Obviously, you guys are just kicking off, but let's fast forward to October, kind of heart of that conference yeah. season. Walk me through what a typical schedule is going to look like for a week for a player in terms of when their classes, meals, practices, game cadence, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, so uh, great question. A week here um, is really no different from a week at the University of Michigan. So on Monday, for example, today, boys woke up. They had weight training at 8 a.m. If they have class, they have to go to class. They'll make up the weight training later in the day on their own. Um, after that, they go back, maybe grab a bite to eat. They'll have class from like 9.30, 10.45, um, 11 to 12 30 grab some lunch if you're a freshman you'll start your study tables at the field house which is where our gymnasium weight room and all that is but we hold our study tables over here so our assistant ad can keep a closer eye um 
Then you might have another class, get dinner. The thing about Lawrence Tech is if you have class and training at the same time, you have to go to class. So we train later at night. We train 9 to 11 p.m. We train at night. So I have everybody for my first team. Uh, for my reserve team, it's a little bit different. They train during the day. Uh, so that's just on Monday. And then same thing on Tuesday. So we do weight training twice a week in the season, Monday and Thursday, 8 a.m. Uh, we train at night, Monday, Tuesday, 9 to 11 p.m., play on Wednesday, recovery on Thursday, 9 to 11 p.m. Friday, we'll train 1 to 2.30 p.m., go straight to the classroom, do about an hour of film work, uh, talk about the previous game, talk about the upcoming game, do our tactical work, this is what worked, this is what didn't. Um, and then we, we may have during the week a couple of position-specific film sessions, about a half hour. Got to keep it short because kids are like goldfish. Got to keep their attention. Um, and then we play again on Saturday. And Sunday, I usually give, I always give the players off. The NAIA is big on a mandatory one day off during the week. I like to be Sunday. Um, but one thing I did not add to that is I do something on Friday nights or Saturday mornings. On Fridays, I call it Force Family Fun. On Saturday mornings, I call it Premier League Watch. So we all get together outside of training, putt putt golf. Go watch another sporting event, bowling. We we'll always do something together, or we'll get together Saturday morning and watch Fulham as my team. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, not many fans for Fulham, um, but we'll get together, bagels, OJ, and just hang out in an auditorium and watch whatever's on at ten a.m. That's that's all. a week in life, and that repeats from August. Until best case scenario, late November. That's right. Well, in terms of of the team, you you, you talked about uh, you know your first team, reserve team, and what those numbers and and that looks like. But what about the staff? Who else makes up your staff? What role does everybody play? And maybe what other support staff outside <laughs> of just coaching staff also help with the team? So right now, this year we currently have sixty one players. I carry. 32 field players, sorry, 31 field players, and four goalkeepers on my first team. We have 15 freshmen, so a big class this year. Um, and then on my reserve team, you have to forget my math, um, probably carry about 23 to 24 on the reserve team. Um, on my staff, and we've got a great staff, uh, my first assistant is Kyle Winningham, he played at Concordia, played in the NAIA. He's currently um, Detroit's DCFC West uh, technical director. I have former Oakland University head coach, Eric Pogue. He oversees my goalkeeping back line, set pieces. Uh, we have three GAs, which is great. And th all three graduate assistants played here. So they have a they know what it's like, and they know what they're doing. Um, and then we have a reserve coach named Alex, local high school, a young guy. Um, and I've kind of given him the reins, trying to teach him. Because uh, I'm not getting any younger. I'm 48. And we have to give back constantly and give these younger guys a chance. And because they're the future. But that's uh, what our staff and our roster look like. Um, reserves, for example, they play anywhere between 12 and 16 games, and we have an, their own league for them as well. We call it the Michigan Reserve League. Um, so we have in it, for example, um, us, Tiffin, which is Division Two down in Ohio, Northwood, Division Two in Midland, uh, Cleary, Lords, Calvin, which is a great D3 program, uh, Spring Arbor, um and a couple other schools so we give them something to play for so they're not just showing up and 
just kicking a ball around. And we give them goals and a flow chart. And this is what we want. Like last year, we had had the reserve league and we won the first year in the inaugural year. So I'm proud of that. Proud of them. Well, and, and you mentioned that there are a number of, of both NAI, D2, D3 schools that have reserve teams. And I think one question that we always hear from players when talking to reserve or schools with reserve teams is, well, what is the movement like? Do I really have a shot at moving up during the season or, or am I a four-year reserve player when you're recruiting me or anything like that? So what, what does that relationship between those teams, two teams look like for you guys? I can only speak for my program. Um, We've had some very great success we've had. So I tell players, when at the reserve meeting that we had last night, here's your flow chart. If you were on reserve team bench, your next goal should be playing in games. If you're playing in games, your next goal should be starting games. If you're starting, your next goal should be getting invited up to first team training. If you get invited up, that's where you got to make me look like an idiot for not having you on the field and not having you there. So I'm going to give you that chance. If you do that, I'm going to move the player down. Maybe he's not playing as much as he should, um, but I will make this switch. I'll give you a couple, two, two examples. One kid, um, Zane Arnold, local kid, played Michigan Wolves, uh, played at a high level before they joined MLS, NAL, and all that. Um, he was on my reserve team for three, two years, right? We brought him up his junior year, worked hard. I mean, just couldn't get him on the field because he had a couple of really good players in front of him. Senior year, just took it over, started every game, played as right back. We had a kid from Hawaii. He busted his butt for three years, and his senior year, he made that jump. So it is possible. Uh, That's what I tell the reserves. I mean, I want you, yes, to get a great degree. But the reason for reserves are, yes, there's a handful of kids that will never make that jump. I'm sorry. You know, I love them. I've given you a chance to play for more years of soccer and get a great degree. But then there are some players that we like, that we think instead of sitting on the bench, you need to play. And where can you get that in the reserve games? For sure. For sure. All right. Well, we talked about staff and reserves and other players, but what about you? Tell us about your coaching style and the style of play you want to play there. My coaching style, uh, it's a big mix. You know, uh, I'm old school. You know, I'm suck it up, buttercup. I didn't have PT after, you know, we just played. Um I, my biggest thing is I will never tell a player to play for me. I will never tell a player to play for the school. I tell them to play for each other. And at the end of the game, you're able to look each other in the eye and say, hey, I did my job. Did you do yours? Because I'll give you a quick little story. Um, I have a tattoo on the back of my left calf, a soccer ball. And there was five of us that played at Ohio State, and we were Awful back in the 90s. I love the school, love the program. Uh, we won maybe six, seven games a year. Uh, but we played for each other, you know. And during COVID, one of them passed away. So the four of us each got the tattoo in different areas on our body. That's what it's about. That's my philosophy, getting you to play for each other. Because four years goes by so quick this phase of your life i had my teammates those four guys wedding being my uh godfather to my kids i'm godfather their kids everything so the relationships and everything that we do will lead to that i'm huge on chemistry if you and i have an issue man i'm not gonna pass you the ball right I'm playing three and you're playing six. Why am I going to give you the ball if you are you and I are fighting over the same girl? We got to put the team first. We got to look over all of that and know that 
we're a family and we're not always going to agree. We're going to have disagreements. We're going to have ups and downs. But at the end of the day, I did mine. You did your job. And that's what it's all about. Love it. Love it. Well, coach, I really appreciate the time. I'm going to leave you with one last question. Uh, and that is, if you had one piece of advice for anybody going through this college soccer recruiting process, what would that be? Be relentless. Be relentless. Email the coaches. Don't just tag them on social media. As coaches, we hate it. I mean, we, I'm getting recruits that tag me in the Indiana men's soccer and University of Kentucky. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. These are three different types of programs. All right. But be relentless. Email. Don't give up just because we don't reply. If you see us, come up, talk to us, you know. Um, and the last last bit of advice is if a pretty girl says no to you, are you just going to give up? No. You just keep going. Keep asking her out. Keep chasing because the risk is worth it. All right. All right. Hopefully well, coach, I appreciate it. Yep. Absolutely. Love it. Wish no you the, wish you the best of luck this fall and, uh, and hope you guys can uh, bring back at that, that conference championship banner. Uh, from your lips, God's ears. <laughs> All Let's right. Let's try Thanks again. Thank Have you. Have a great day. You too.